Hello, welcome aboard Submarine Bakuna. My name is Greg and I am the Submarine Manager and Shipboard Educator here at Independence Seaport Museum and today I'm going to take you on a virtual tour of this historic vessel. Bakuna's forward torpedo room. This compartment is located all the way forward on the boat, meaning at the front, and is one of two torpedo rooms that Bakuna possesses, the other being all the way back aft, or at the back of the boat. Here you will find six of Bakuna's ten torpedo tubes, as well as space to carry eight spare torpedoes and bunking for between 12 and 15 men. Above me is Bakuna's escape trunk. This trunk would be used in an event of an emergency, typically if the submarine sank in 100 feet of water or less. You could send four men at a time up into the trunk. They would close the bottom hatch, flood the trunk, which would allow them to open the side door, and then swim to safety. You, men down here would then close the side door, drain the trunk, and repeat the process as many times as necessary for everyone in the compartment to escape. This compartment is called the forward battery, and that's because below the deck are half of Bakuna's lead acid batteries. But the space you see around me in this narrow hallway is officer's country. Bakuna would have had a crew of around 80 men. Of those, eight were officers, five were chief petty officers, and the remaining 69 or so were all enlisted. The enlisted men had berthing spaces further aft, and we'll see those in a moment. Up here in this space, you will find accommodations for all eight officers, as well as the five chief petty officers. These accommodations include the wardroom for the officers, which is where they would take their meals, talk strategy, and spend their free time, as well as a pantry and a shower for officers use only. At the back end of the compartment, you'll find the human shack, which is where the ship's clerk would take care of all the paperwork. And you'll also find five bunks for the chief petty officers. Chief Petty Officers are technically enlisted men, but because of their rank, they are afforded a small amount of privacy separate from the rest of the enlisted crew. And that is why they are bunked up here in the forward battery, as opposed to further back aft where the rest of the crew sleeps. This is the control room. And as the name might suggest to you, this is where we control the boat from. There are four major stations in this compartment to be aware of. The first is the auxiliary helm. The main helm is located up in the conning tower directly overhead. The conning tower also possesses the two periscopes, radar and sonar equipment, as well as a fire control system for our torpedoes. But in the event that something happens to the conning tower, either it floods or otherwise becomes inoperable for some reason, the auxiliary helm still allows us a way that we can steer the submarine without having to worry about the conning tower. Everything around the auxiliary helm you will find up by the main helm, including your motor order telegraphs, your gyro compass repeater, your rudder angle indicator, and of course your helm or steering wheel. The second station is our dive planes. The dive plans control Bakuna's angle as she submerges or surfaces through the water. Contrary to popular belief, when a submarine dives, it doesn't simply just go straight down. It actually angles through the water like a plane flying through the air. Once you reach your desired depth, you level off again. It's these dive planes that control that angle as we go down or come up, with the bow planes being controlled by the forward wheel and the stern planes being controlled by the aft wheel. The dive station also has our depth gauges, which allow us to monitor how deep the submarine is in the ocean. The Kuna has an operational test depth of around 400 feet, with a crush depth of around 600. No submarine ever wants to go below its crush depth. Next we have our hydraulic manifold. The nickname for this station is Christmas Tree because the lights on the display are red and green. 
Each one of these lights corresponds to a hatch or hall opening somewhere on the boat. If the light is green, that hatch is closed. If the light is red, that hatch is open. When we're diving, we want what's called a green board, which is all the lights on the display are green. Because if one light is red, that means something somewhere is flooding, and that's no good for anybody down here. The final station we're going to talk about is our compressed air manifold. Compressed air on a submarine does everything from flushing our toilets, to starting our engines, to firing our torpedoes. But perhaps its most important function is to blow the ballast tanks clear of water so that we can service. In order for a submarine to submerge, it must increase its density and therefore decrease its buoyancy. We do this by flooding the ballast tanks which are located along the outside of the submarine's hull. Water enters, the submarine gains with density, and it submerges beneath the surface. In order for us to come back to the surface, we need to get that water out. So we'll force compressed air in through the tops of those ballast tanks, push the water out, and come to the surface. We are now on the mess deck, where the cruise mess and galley are located. The galley is simply the ship's kitchen, and is where all food aboard is prepared, cooked, and served from. The cruise mess is where the enlisted crew would take their meals. Remember, officers all eat up forward in the wardroom. There are four tables in this space. Each one is capable of seating six men at a time, so you can feed 24 submariners in one go. This still requires you to rotate through shifts because all 69 men plus 5 chiefs cannot fit in here at one time. Food aboard a submarine was stored wherever food would fit. There is a refrigeration space below the deck for meats and veggies and fruits, but you would very frequently find that cans would be stacked along the deck, sometimes two or three deep, and you would cram bread into the overhead or wherever it would fit. Food on a submarine was also oftentimes better than food that you might receive if you were on a surface vessel. One of the many incentives to join the submarine service was the food, as well as better pay and better rate of promotion. Submarine service is voluntary. You will never join the Navy and be assigned to a submarine. You have to ask for it, because if you cannot handle the mental and physical rigors of being on a boat like this, they don't want you there. So food is simply one of the incentives to get people to try out for subservice. This space is also the most open compartment on the boat, and therefore this is the place where the enlisted crew would often recreate. Recreation included things like playing cards, reading books, board games as you can see on the tables, or watching movies. A submarine typically carried two films for the duration of its patrol, a period of time that could be between 60 and 65 days. By the time you returned home from that patrol, you knew those two movies really well. If you were lucky, however, and encountered another submarine or another surface vessel, you could see if they were willing to trade films. During World War II, however, the Kunis crew was so fond of the film Tombstone, The Town Too Tough to Die, they refused to trade that film for anything. We're now in the after battery. Like the forward battery, the after battery gets its name because below the deck, is the other half of Bakuna's lead acid batteries. But what you see behind me is crew berthing. There are 35 racks in this space, which is just enough, if you do the math, for 69 enlisted men to rotate through, sharing two to a bunk. Remember that not everyone sleeps at the same time. Someone always has to be up making sure the submarine is sailing correctly and operating as it is supposed to. This often brings up the subject of hot racking. Hot racking is when I am getting out of my bunk and the next person is getting in. He's getting into a warm mattress that is probably covered in a little bit of my sweat. Aboard fleet boats like Bakuna and submarines like her, hot racking is largely a myth. Keep in mind that there are not only 35 bunks in this space, but there are 15 other bunks in the forward torpedo room and 15 more bunks in the aft torpedo room. Fleet boats, like Bakuna, at the time of their construction, were often regarded as the peak of crew habitability and comfort. Other submarines of the era, in use by other countries, were oftentimes much smaller, 
and their quarters far more cramped, which is where hot racking really rose from. At the far end of the compartment, you'll find the cruise head, which is the bathroom, as well as a shower and a pair of sinks. The shower was often used to store potatoes and other dry goods. The crew, in order to use it, would often have to eat their way into it. And even then, showering aboard a submarine was limited to once a week for two minutes per shower. This was an effort to conserve fresh water. Bakuna's crew could make fresh water by using two stills and evaporators located in the forward engine room. Those two stills could make a thousand gallons of water a day, but even so, the bulk of that fresh water went towards refilling the batteries. Because the batteries are lead acid, the chemical reaction that takes place to create electricity oftentimes dries the acid out. You had to use distilled water to refill it. If you used salt water or water with other impurities, you risked creating chlorine gas, and breathing in chlorine gas on a submarine is oftentimes quite deadly. The other uses for that fresh water were cooking and drinking, as well as washing the boat. Again, you can't use salt water to wash the boat because the boat is made of metal and salt water corrodes metal. So using the distilled water to clean the crew was oftentimes at the bottom of the importance list. We are now in Bakuna's aft engine room. Bakuna actually has two engine rooms, the aft one and the forward engine room immediately in front of it. Both engine rooms are more or less exactly the same. Both contain two General Motors V16 diesel engines and two electric generators. Bakuna is a diesel electric submarine, which means unlike a car or a surface ship, the engines don't actually control the speed of the boat. Instead, they provide power to the electric generators. The electricity coming off those generators is what we use to power the boat. We can have that electricity either go to our batteries for charging, which we'll then use when the boat is submerged, or that electricity can go straight to our main propulsion motors. It's the motors that will actually control the speed of the submarine. It is from this spot that we control Bakuna's main propulsion system. The giant cage in the center of the room is called the electrical cubicle, and we use it to direct the flow of electricity coming off the generators. We do that by using these bus switches here. These bus switches can either have the power coming off those generators go straight to our batteries for charging, or directly to our motors for more direct propulsion. These switches also control the direction of the motors either forward or stern. There would typically be two electricians on duty at this station at any one time, one controlling the starboard side of the boat and the other controlling the port side of the boat. If you look at the display itself, it seems pretty intimidating, but the reality of it is it is almost perfectly symmetrical. The starboard side of the display controls the starboard side of the boat and the port side of the display controls the port side of the boat. The only real difference is on the starboard side of the display, there's an altimeter. An altimeter is usually found on aircraft because it indicates altitude by measuring air pressure. On board a submarine, we have it because in 1951, Bakuna was fitted out with a snorkel. And a snorkel does exactly what you think it does. It allows us to dive down to about 60 feet or so and continue to run our diesel engines by bringing fresh air into the submarine. At the top of the snorkel valve, is a clapper that is designed to snap shut when a wave passes over to prevent water from coming down the snorkel tube and flooding the boat. If that valve gets stuck shut, there's no way to know because none of the crew can look through the pressure hull plus 60 feet of water or so and say, hey, that's broken. So if the clapper valve gets stuck shut, the engines, which are still running, will start to suck air out of the boat. As they suck air out of the boat, the air pressure inside the boat will start to decrease. If the electrician on duty sees the altimeter needle jump and then stay jumped, he will know something is wrong with the snorkel valve, he'll shut down the engines, and he'll divert to battery power in order to prevent the crew from suffocating to death.
Here we are in the aft torpedo room. We finally reached the other end of the boat. Unlike the forward torpedo room, the aft torpedo room only has four torpedo tubes. It does, however, also contain bunking for the crew and an escape trunk. However, the difference between this escape trunk and the escape trunk up forward is that in order to utilize this escape trunk, the crew would have to flood the entire compartment and then swim out, as opposed to just flooding the escape trunk up forward while keeping the rest of the compartment dry. Bakuna's aft torpedo room also contains an example of a Mark 14 steam-driven torpedo. The Mark 14 was the most common type of torpedo used by American submarines during World War II and the early decades of the Cold War. It is 21 feet long, 21 inches in diameter, and weighs approximately a ton and a half. The Mark 14 can be broken down into four distinct sections. The first section is the warhead, located at the front of the torpedo. The warhead is about 660 pounds, but usually contains an explosive of either Torpex or TNT. The second section is the air flask section. The air flask contains compressed air that both helps with the buoyancy of the torpedo as well as feeds into the combustion chamber where it mixes with alcohol and water to create steam. The third section is the afterbody section. The afterbody section contains the combustion chamber, the turbine, and the gyro basically anything the torpedo needs in order to function properly and travel to its target. And the last section is the tail, which contains the two propellers that push the torpedo through the water. Well, that concludes our virtual tour of Submarine Bakuna. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. With any luck, we'll see you here at the museum in person sometime in the future.